Hello and welcome to this podcast from the BBC World Service. Please let us know what you think and tell other people about us on social media. Podcasts from the BBC World Service are supported by advertising. This is the Witness History Podcast from the BBC World Service. I'm Claire Bowes. And now a programme from our archives. It was on the 9th of July 1985 that the Greenpeace campaign ship, the Rainbow Warrior, was bombed by French secret agents in Auckland, New Zealand. One crew member was killed and the old North Sea trawler, which had found a new life as a vehicle for environmentalists, was sunk. The Rainbow Warrior had sailed to Canada to stop seal culls and harassed the whaling fleets of Russia and Japan. She and her crew were in New Zealand as part of a campaign against French nuclear testing in Polynesia. Her captain, Pete Wilcox, spoke to me in 2010. We had just come from the Marshall Islands where we had relocated an entire village from an atoll that had been nuked by the US nuclear testing program in the 50s. Because that year, 1985, that was a year of protesting nuclear testing in the Pacific. Our feeling was if it was safe, do it in Paris. If it was safe, do it in Washington, D.C. But don't turn smaller third world countries into your testing zone. The crew sailed into Auckland, New Zealand, to prepare for the next leg of the journey. Spirits were high. They'd just celebrated campaign manager Steve Sawyer's birthday and the young crew were excited about their first trip to the South Pacific. I remember going to bed at about 10.30, 11 o'clock. And at quarter of 12, uh, I felt the boat shake violently. And my first inclination was that we'd been in a collision at sea. So I immediately rolled over and looked out my forward porthole and saw that we were tied to Marston Wharf. And I laid back down thinking, well, whatever happened, it can't be my fault because we're tied to the dock. And I was relieved to see that we were safe at shore, so to speak. And when I lay back down, I realized that the sounds normally that I heard on the ship, and that is the generator running in the background, weren't weren't on. So I thought something had happened in the engine room. And normally, Davy Edward would be right down there and taking care of it, and he wouldn't, <laughs> wouldn't need any help from me at all. But things didn't sound right outside, so I, I started to get up, and the first thing I noticed was my glasses that had hung on a shelf for the preceding four years, and all kinds of weather weren't there. So I grabbed a towel off the wall and walked the 8 to 10 meters down the hallway to the engine room door to find Davy standing there in a state of disbelief going, well, it's over, she's finished, she's done for. And I thought, well, come on, what are you talking about? And I looked down and the water was just a meter below the deck level that we were standing on, and I absolutely couldn't think any reason for that. I just thought, well, somebody's left a tap running. We'll figure this out. So I I started walking back aft because I realized that if the water was so close to the main deck level, then the after accommodations would be underwater, which in fact they were. And I got to the stairs. I looked down and the martini, the first mate, was down there. And he had already gotten everybody up. And that's when the second bomb went off. It went off right underneath us. It had been placed on the propeller. And that's when I became alarmed. That's when I thought... There is really something bad going on, and that's when I started calling out abandoned ship. Pete scrambled back to his cabin to find some clothes, and as he did so, the boat started to list. It was sinking rapidly, so he and Davy Edward, the chief engineer, joined the others on the dock. And that's when they realised that photographer Fernando Pereira was missing. While we were standing on the dock, Davy told me Fernando was down in the boat, and... I didn't think there was any way possible I was going to be able to swim down through the diesel oil and down two decks to get him and find him without becoming trapped myself. So as soon as the police arrived, we said, we're we're missing this crew member. We think he's still in there. They took us all across the street and an hour later came with a dive team. And it took a second dive team. The first dive team couldn't get down to him. The Navy divers did. But that wasn't for maybe three hours after the boat was was down. They found Fernando's body in his cabin. He'd become trapped, the door slamming shut after the second bomb exploded. But despite this tragedy, suspicion fell on the Rainbow Warriors themselves. I was taken by the police up to the police station and just kept there. At 8 o'clock the next morning, they took me down to the harbour master's office 
and wanted me to sign a note saying I'd be responsible for removing the wreckage from Auckland Harbor because at this point, I think the police were still suspicious that it was something we had done on ourselves for publicity. I mean, they were, they were very skeptical about everything that was going on. They took me back down to the boat, and it was that morning at about 10 o'clock that the Navy divers going down for a second or third time had found the hole and told the police that absolutely the bomb had been on the outside of the ship and all the jagged metal edges were going in. And I think when that happened, there became a real attitude change with the New Zealand police who realized that it hadn't been us. It, it really was somebody else had put bombs on the boat and created what became the only the second act of political terrorism in New Zealand history. They were they were angry. They were really angry. This sort of thing just didn't go on in New Zealand. We now have a homicide. We have a, a major criminal act. We have the implication of political or terrorist overtime. And we have, therefore, as a country, an urgent need to investigate it. And the police force of New Zealand are doing so. Uh, efficiently, and they will be given every resource they need to do that. The Prime Minister of New Zealand, David Longy. And the police effort soon paid off. Two weeks later, a couple claiming to be Swiss honeymooners were arrested. A man and a woman have appeared before a local court charged with murder and sabotage over the sinking of the Greenpeace ship Rainbow Warrior. It sank in Auckland Harbour a fortnight ago after two explosions. In Switzerland, the authorities say Swiss passports found on the accused are false. They were, in fact, French secret agents, Alain Maffard and Dominique Prieur. They'd helped build the bombs which four other agents planted. They disappeared and were never found but Mafar and Priya were discovered as they tried to leave the country. Pete Wilcox went to see them in court. Uh, we went to, to watch the proceedings, although at, at that point, because I had lost my glasses on the ship, I wasn't seeing much, but we, we were there. And again, just the complete feeling of disbelief that uh, we had caused so much worry and aggravation to such a major superpower that they had to resort to this to, to stop us. And I suppose everyone at this point is trying to piece this together. What had you been told and, and what did you think about it? Well, the details would come out over the following weeks. I mean, the, the trail that the collective French team left through New Zealand is written in books about. I mean, they partied all their way down the coast. They had a 45-foot sailboat that they smuggled the explosives in with. It's just a, a huge story. and They were about as subtle as a bomb big feeling there at the time was just absolute disbelief that this would have been done. And looking at them in court, what did you feel? Not very much. They were soldiers. Soldiers do what they're ordered. It would be easy to look at it, I think, cynically or in a detached way if Fernando hadn't been killed. Fernando was the only crew member on the ship with two children. And it was a devastating event for them, absolutely devastating, to know that their father was murdered by the government of France. Two months later, the French government admitted that the secret agents had been sent to neutralise the Rainbow Warrior. Sentenced to 10 years imprisonment for manslaughter, Maffat and Prieur served just two before returning to France. Pete Wilcox continued to campaign for Greenpeace at sea. He spoke to me for Witness History in 2010. And if you'd like to listen to more of our first-hand accounts of the past, we've got hundreds more in our online archive. Just search online or on your podcast app for BBC Witness History. Elephant, squid, camel, hedgehog, 30 amazing animals, Galen, lobsters, fake cat, polar bear, cow, trap, jaw, and and 30 brilliant ideas that were inspired by them. A concussion proof sports helmet, race to develop a vaccine, a new way of exploring space. 30 animals that made us smarter is back with 30 more tales of how the animal kingdom has helped us solve complex human problems. These are truly extraordinary creatures. 30 animals that made us smarter. Season 2 from the BBC World Service. Keep the noise down and follow me. Search for 30 animals that made us smarter wherever you get your podcasts.